All right, we ready? Yeah, <clears throat> let's go. Dr. Rob McNamara, lovely to have you on the show. Matt Frad, great to be here. You are my neighbor. Yes, across the street. But I'm going to ask you what you do as if I don't know, so you can tell the people at home what you do. What is it you do? I teach for Franciscan University for the philosophy department and also some courses in theology. I've That's taught for them for eight and a half years, mostly in Garmin in Austria on their study abroad campus, mm. where I began teaching for the university and then came over here a few years ago. From Ireland? Yes, originally. You got a great Irish accent. Thank you, Matt. Your Irish and, accent is di I mean, I know Irish accents differ greatly. I used to live there. Yeah. There's something about your accent. It's fantastic. Yeah, my family lived in Dublin on the East Coast. Well, r near Dublin, Maynooth on the East Coast when, when I was a kid. Then we moved west. And so I think I got mm. a bit of both accents and a kind of neutralization of both. Do so, you have people from home when they speak to you say that you've lost your accent? Yeah. Yeah. Me Sometimes too. they don't recognize I'm Irish anymore, which is sad. Yeah. But when you're around them, do you find you start picking it up? Yeah, and also when I'm upset or <laughs> sick or angry, then my <laughs> accent comes out stronger for some reason. Ah, yeah. I can see you trying to like uh, ask a girl out in a pub, but you don't have your accent anymore, so you got to get really angry. <laughs> hey, <laughs> and maybe, then she's like, maybe back in the day, it. but now being married, exactly. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, yeah, and congratulations on your beautiful boy. Thank you. We yeah, we just had yeah. a boy New Year's Eve, so. Delighted about that. Yeah, so Absolutely are my kids because yeah. they are very much fans of holding yeah, babies. Yeah, they're all very motherly and fatherly. Yeah. It's a great neighborhood to live in. It is. Yeah. yeah. Hashtag Steubenville. We're taking more people. I don't know. I'm looking at you like you've got a response to that. Yeah. Like, Do you know that Thursday showed up at Steubenville yeah. with his bags in his car? You were telling me. Without no one. Is that right? I had a box of books, a box of clothes, and a mattress in the bed of my truck, and no apartment no job and no idea what I was doing. And you said, and I so showed cool, up at dude. Mark Barnes's New Year's Eve party and was like, Hey guys, I live here now. And had you known Mark, please before be this? my friend. I talked to him once on the phone and he was like, you should not think about it and just come to Steubenville. And right. I was like, all right, cool. So you heard how beautiful it was and what a lovely little town it was. Yeah. I, uh, I was, um, I had a really crappy job before this. Uh, but not before this job, obviously. I was working for Jacob and Imam, so okay. it was a great job. Yeah. But before I moved to Stumba, I had a really crappy job, and I was miserable. Um, and I wanted to, I just wanted to be Catholic. And I felt like I was being hindered where I was. Yeah. And so I decided yeah, yeah. to take the risk, and I figured worse comes to worse, I would go back to Indianapolis and pick up somewhere along the lines. Yeah. Um, you do. Whenever you leave this town, you do realize how beautiful other cities are, then, don't you? Yeah. Like I'm yeah. shocked. I'll go to places yeah. and I have the opposite sometimes experience. I do really. Yeah, I can't. Like, I mean, I always miss Steubenville. <clears throat> There's something real, we're going to lose most of our audience at this point, but who cares? Uh, uh, um, yeah, you go. I think it's the community here. That's you know? exactly yeah. right. Because when I go back home or when I go to other cities and places, there's less of a Catholic community, and it it just seems to buoy you up. Yeah. And I don't. I suppose it's what makes a town, despite the infrastructure mm -hmm. here being somewhat dilapidated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When did you get your doctorate? Two thousand and nineteen. I finished okay. early two thousand nineteen. I defended February twenty second. When did you know you wanted to get a PhD? I had. Or was it a different kind of doctorate? No. Yeah, it was a PhD. Okay. So uh, it's kind of a maybe to give the proper context a, a longish story, but mm -hmm. I'll shorten it. I had returned to the practice of the faith in my early to mid twenties. You, you living in Ireland know this, Irish society drifted away from the practice of the faith over maybe the 1980s, 1990s. And like that, I, with my peers drifted too. Early in my twenties for personal reasons, one of which being my mom's passing and questions surrounding that, her illness and her death and where was she now? I started to question whether or not my leaving the faith was a good idea. Mm -hmm. In desperation, started to pray, began to discover things Catholic again, and at the same time realized that I didn't have a clue what mm. uh, the Catholic religion actually thought about what it means to be human, the structure of reality. Even though I'd been schooled in Catholic schools all my yeah. life, perhaps I wasn't listening close enough. So then I set out in the study of uh, theology. Well, where were you living and was there any kind of Catholic community around you to help yeah. kind of guide you or did I was you just living, read your way back into the faith? 
I was living in Galway and Dublin over the course of years as I be, returned to the faith. Mm -hmm. There were Catholic communities, two of which were particularly decisive. U2000, you've probably heard yeah, of, yeah. and another small Irish community, Pure in Heart. Mm -hmm. And those two were a, like a peer support structure. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I became voraciously interested in reading into the faith. And that then led me to the study of theology. And I went to Austria to study at the ITI, the International Theological Institute. Wow. And that was a wonderful experience, just a great liturgical, communal and academic environment. And out of that, then I thought I was being called to be a priest. So I entered seminary in Maynooth, Ireland for a couple of years. And when that seemed to hit the rocks, I really wanted to explore the idea of teaching mm -hmm. in relation to the faith. So I thought it, to do a doctor of philosophy would be a good idea. So you've always been intellectually inclined then, because not a lot of people would regain interest in the faith and then go study at the ITI. Yeah. In my schooling, I was scientifically inclined. So I loved the maths and the sciences mm. and originally studied physics at university. But when I, re when I returned to the faith, I realized there was physics as a way of grasping reality was preliminary and philosophy and theology moved further than that. And so um, I think with my conversion just came this, you, you know what it's like, Matt, just this desire to explore this desire to find out more. And uh, fortunately that hasn't left me since. I don't have as much time to read books anymore, but I like reading nonetheless. So when did you decide you were going to focus more on philosophy than theology? I initially started or, studying theology. And okay. then as I studied it, I realized you need the philosophical underpinnings to do so. And I just found myself more at home there. Mm. My philosophical interests have a theological leaning in a semi-consistent way, but uh, I just felt myself more capacitated for that kind of study. Mm. And I suppose we're all kitted with different talents and that was where maybe God wanted me to focus my talents. But I do like teaching theology as well, particularly those uh, subjects related to vocation, Christian marriage, theology of the body, that kind of subject. Um, what was your dissertation on? It was uh, on the human person in St. Edith Stein. Oh. And in as much as she incorporated insights received from Aquinas and the scholastic tradition, and thought through them phenomenologically to give us a contemporary presentation of what it means to be a human person. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, I, really I enjoyed it. Am I right in thinking that her dissertation was something of a Socratic dialogue between Aquinas and Husserl? She did write a Socratic dialogue between Aquinas and Husserl, but it wasn't that her wasn't, dissertation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, her dissertation was on, on empathy. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, for us uh, midwits, what's, who's Husserl? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll get okay. there. Yeah, piece by yeah, piece. There's a lot that gets to, we have to unpack yeah. here. Yeah, because I mean, unless people are somewhat intimately familiar with Voitiwa, love and responsibility, yeah, theology of the body, they may not have even heard of phenomenology. Yeah. So, but so, what was it initially that attracted you to Stein? Originally, I was attracted to Aquinas, and when I want to do doctoral studies, I realized that if I'm to study Aquinas to add anything of any value, I'd have to take a really specific area of his of his mm. corpus. And Absolutely. I wanted to be a teacher more than a scholar. I like being a scholar, but really I found myself more alive teaching. Mm -hmm. So the idea of studying something more broad through the eyes of a contemporary seemed a good way to go about it. I had been introduced to Wojtyla and his scholastic and phenomenological leanings. And so Stein remained in the wings as this person of interest, mm -hmm. person of curiosity. And when I was in seminary then, my one of my teachers, uh, Dr. Meta Liebeck, she was a Stein scholar and she often mentioned Stein during her lectures and then ran a conference on Stein. And I, en I went to that conference and I just thought, this is wonderful. I have to get to know more. So when I started Doctor Studies then, it was the person, it was Stein, it was Aquinas. Mm. It was just a matter of figuring out the, the middle pieces. So what was it about Aquinas that you wanted to study? You said you wanted to pick something yeah. more specific. I, I wanted to, no, I, I, I knew that I would, had, would have had to unless I took oh, him through I'm the eyes sorry. of a contemporary yep. to, and then I could take a broad area like the person. Mm. So the person in Aquinas is rich, deep. It's not as expansive as contemporary personalism. He's not a personalist thinker, so to speak, but he does have the seeds of personalism and his understanding of the person largely wrought in a theological context is, is, um, yeah, a worthy area of study. But I wanted to do it with respect to the human person, which he doesn't write on very frequently, though he writes on human nature. And I wanted to do it in some way that would be compelling to the contemporary generation. Okay. It, yeah. yeah. It, it, might be it might be helpful. It will be helpful. Let's talk about phenomenology in Husserl and what he was responding to. 
And yeah. just a kind of brief overview okay. of that for those who aren't aware. Yeah, so one of the great movements of philosophy in the 20th century is one that was began by Edmund Husserl. The beginning of the 20th century, he published a book, The Logical Investigations, in a number of volumes. And in that work, he begins to lay out what has come to be called phenomenology. And it's hard to define phenomenology because in its many practitioners, it's taken up in various different ways and there's no doctrinal commitments to it. And so it's kind of difficult to pin down. But you could basically set it as the study or science of phenomena. And what are phenomena? They're the elements of experience. Mm -hmm. And so phenomenology closely attends to conscious experience in an effort to unpack its contents and therefore give us reality at its most refined, comprehensive and clear. And so it's in a way to return to the things themselves as we experience them and not leave anything behind. And, and talk about why that was necessary given Hume and Kant yeah. and where people were at. So um, various different philosophical schools or traditions had developed by this point. Empiricism would be one, British empiricism, or Kantian, which would be an understanding that the mind brings to reality most of what's given in our experience. Empiricism, there would be a sense that we in the mind represent reality, like we have an image of reality. And phenomenology in a way seeks to answer both of these ways of thinking about how we come to know by speaking about the intentionality of the mind. So the, our cognitive faculties are ordered towards the world in an intentional way. That is, our mind is about the world or of the world. And so what we have in experience then is consciousness, the acts of consciousness, like I think, I doubt, I remember, I, I wish and then the objects that are given in those acts. And it seeks to unveil all of the aspects there. What is the structure of consciousness? What, are the, what is the structure of the acts of consciousness? And what are the objects given in consciousness? And in that way, it, ten, it, it I suppose, attempts to be more faithful to how we experience the world mm. and experience ourselves in the world. So was it that like after the time of human Kant, there was this separation between us and the world and we got maybe too much into our heads and yeah. our ideas of things. And it was like, let's return to the things themselves. And yeah, yeah. We can at least talk about our experience of those things, yeah. whatever they are, because at least there's a subjective element to that, but it's also maybe the best we got. Uh, we'll yeah. Talk to that. Yeah. yeah there, there tends to be in contemporary thought a, a mind world problem and a mind body problem. And, and both of these problems are in some way coordinate with one another. And, in different ways, uh, Kantian philosophy would propose this problem. You have the mind and its phenomena, but the noumenal world mm -hmm. we know nothing of. And empiricism, in a way, has a tendency to divide us from the world because what we know are the representations we have mm -hmm. of the things. And so we don't really have direct access. Well, if we focus on conscious experience, we see that it's actually given very differently than this. What we have is me as a conscious subject experiencing acts of consciousness with objects of the world given in those acts of consciousness. Mm. And so there's a kind of holistic unity to that. We can abstract consciousness or its acts or the objects, <clears throat> but really what we have is a unified experience. I am conscious of this wonderful Pints with Aquinas mug and its contents. However you pronounce that. Yeah, <laughs> well, I won't try some <laughs> yeah. beer. And, um, that's really what we have given in experience. And if all of our knowledge is based upon experience, mm -hmm. as it was for Aquinas and Aristotle, then we have to attend again to experience. And so one could think of phenomenologically, phenom the phenomenological school or movement as a way of attending to reality. Mm -hmm. And so the phenomenological philosopher leaves behind the natural attitude, mm -hmm. enters into the phenomenological attitude, which would be a focused attention upon experience and then an attempt to descriptively unpack experience. Mm. Now I'm a complete amateur here, so please correct me and, and lead me forward. But my understanding is that Wojtyla sought to look at our experiences of being male and female and the sexual acts we might engage in through a phenomenological lens um, and maybe show how that isn't incong incongruent with Thomistic teleology. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, so, it's, yeah. so like, um, look, look at your experience, uh, not as if this is something subjective, wholly independent of 
teleology, but the two somehow are mutually supportive. Yeah. Talk to that. Yeah, so <clears throat> philosophical schools or traditions or movements don't often have good dialogue between them. And both Wojtyla and Stein mm. recognized that this sealing off of contemporary philosophy, phenomenology, from the medieval philosophy, scholasticism, was problematic because it's not like our ancestors didn't see the world and didn't think clearly about the world. So both in their own way then thought to bring a kind of synthesis of methods of doing philosophy, the scholastic way of disputation mm -hmm. and the phenomenological way of attending in a focused way to experience. And I think both then added value to the Western tradition by thinking about scholastic themes in a contemporary method or mode of doing philosophy and in a way gave more light to those themes. So both take up Aquinas, both are, you could say, faithful to the corpus of Aquinas, but both rethink the concepts Aquinas presented and cast more light upon them. Mm. And for Wojtyla, a lot of that was to do with man and woman, marriage and family, the sacramentality yeah. of marriage and, and just wonderful work. You know, they, they talk about how modern man is much more subjective than yeah. medieval man. I mean, you look at Aquinas's five proofs for God's existence. He... I mean, he may allude in different places, but at least in the five ways, yeah. there's not a moral argument. There's not an argument from beauty. Yeah. Uh, even the argument from God's definition, he takes issue with. Um, whereas today, we yeah. talk a lot about how we feel. Yeah. And it seems like maybe that's why this school of phenomenology and how uh, how Wojtyla used it perhaps was a new way of talking about sexual morality in a way that modern man can resonate with. Yeah. Do I have that wrong? No, no. Um, and what do I mean? Because <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. In one of his articles, Wojtyla divides the history of philosophy into two major eras mm. or two major ways of doing philosophy. The ancients and medievals proposed a philosophy of being, which was a kind of objective metaphysical explanation of reality. And then you have Descartes in the modern era, at the beginning of the modern era, and he then turns towards the subject and mm. proposes, and many philosophers since then propose a philosophy of consciousness. Now, of course, if you have a philosophy of being and it's objective, it's wonderful. A philosophy of consciousness and attention to the subject, it's also wonderful. But Wojtyla recognized that, mm -hmm. well, these are two poles of experience and we need both to have a properly comprehensive explanation of the world and how we, how we find ourselves in the mm. world. And so I think that that division, it's brutish, but it does do work. And it's just really obvious to us in our own experience we're conscious subjects and we're in the world experiencing it objectively. And we need to look at both the objects we're experiencing and us as the ones experiencing mm -hmm. so as to give us a holistic picture. Yeah. And when you apply this then to, uh, let's say, man and woman, and you do a biblical analysis like Wojtyla did in The Theology of the Body, he unpacks the meaning of the Garden of Eden scene of our first parents with great and wondrous detail. And I think he answers, he answers the desires of modern man to understand what it means to be a subject in the world, but places it in this objective context that we are creatures before the creator and there's a meaning to our subjective experience before God, like there was for Adam and like there was for Eve in the garden. Mm. What is personalism? It's um, a philosophical or theological movement that attends to the person with priority. You could say the central given of your exploration is the person and what it means to be a person. Again, like phenomenology, it's, it's hard to pin down because it's more like a movement than it is like a school and various different, there are various different personalisms. Mm -hmm. But with the Catholic tradition and philosophy, you have Wojtyla, Stein, von Hildebrandt and other thinkers who propose a, Don't worry, he's in, just adjusting yeah, the camera. <laughs> who propose a, a personalistic philosophy that's coherent with the Catholic tradition. So yeah, okay. it places the person at the center. As opposed to? As opposed to being, as opposed to consciousness mm. or the mind, as opposed to logic, as opposed to language. Mm. Uh, what, and now in a way the person takes up all of these spheres because Persons are beings in the world with beings. Persons are conscious. Persons are language users. Persons should perform logical reasoning if we want to think rightly. So there's a way in which focusing on the person has strands to all of the various philosophic traditions. Persons are ethical beings. So it, it's, 
it's legitimate to attend to the person with priority in this way, I would say. What are people's concerns with phenomenology? Because I've, I've heard that sometimes Thomists and phenomenologists on campus take issue with each other, yeah. perhaps not in any sort of serious yeah. way, but what is the kind of initial critique you sometimes hear? Do they see it as a threat to Thomism? Yeah. And why? Well, this modern turn toward the subject um, is the, I suppose, beginning point of many philosophical and consequently cultural and social and political problems. Mm. And so one can think of it from a contemporary perspective, we can be radically individualistic or we can be relativistic morally. Like I have my this truth. This is my and, truth. This yeah, is exactly. my ex lived experience, etc. Yeah. So when we attend to the subject of a priority, it can bring with it many problems that are not merely theoretical, but with real practical import. So, of course, Catholic mm -hmm. theologians, philosophers then are wary of that turn toward the subject. Mm, I see. And so with Descartes, you have this idea that what I can know with priority, first and foremost, and above and beyond everything else is that I am. Mm -hmm. And so there's a kind of solipsism, which mm -hmm. means uh, um, oneself alone. And then there's a difficulty getting back out into the world. Yeah, it's like the door is locked now yeah. from yeah. the inside in a way. You're yeah. not, you're not yeah, connecting yeah. with the world. And so yeah. then you have the mind-world problem, the mind-body problem. And you have then various practical problems, like many of the problems we're dealing with in contemporary society, hot button issues and stuff. But Wojtyla and Stein recognize that this turn toward the subject, though it brings with it these deviations, is actually an authentic philosophical development, if properly complemented by mm -hmm. remaining yes. present to the objective world and to be. Right, yeah. And then placing in that context, you have the possibility to overcome the problems and at the same time appeal to contemporary man with his subjective interests. And if you think about it, subject and object, they're, they're co-relative ideas. Mm -hmm. And so to unmoor them from one another is a problem. Like this cup is a thing which is now the object of my sight, my knowledge and my love. But it's only an object because I'm a personal subject who's perceiving it. And I am the personal subject who's always related to objects. So if I decouple the object and the subject, we have a, immediately mm. a problem. And the, cue, the clue is in the words. They're both uh, formed by the same suffix. And so they show that they're in some way related to one another. That's really good. You don't have subjects without objects or objects without subjects. Right. So to attend to our experience isn't to say that there is not an objective way the world is or an objective way to which our actions should conform. Yeah. But sometimes reflecting upon our own experience shows why uh, there are certain objective truths that we have to conform to. Um, and yeah. again, don't, please yeah. don't please correct me because yeah. I actually don't know what I'm talking about. No, no, you, you do. You're 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 you're, you're so, tracking this conversation. Well, as I say things, don't be just don't just yeah. nod. Please correct yeah. me. All right. Yeah. So here, here's here's nothing kind to correct of, so far as far as I can see. All right. So um, suppose I'm having difficulty accepting the church's teaching on human sexuality in some aspect. You know, I read Aquinas, I see that he says something is a mortal sin, let's say yeah. sex outside of marriage. Um, and, but, but then if you were to say to me, like, what does it feel like when somebody treats you as merely a means to an end? Yeah, I'd be like, oh, it feels gross. Like, yeah. I, I hate that feeling. And I think we've all had that feeling. Okay, yeah. what does that then say about you objectively then? Yeah. So it enables me to kind of connect with the objective truth that I'm a person made in the image and likeness of God. And as Wojtyla says in Love and Responsibility, the human person is a good towards which the only proper and adequate attitude is love. So we can state that objectively and we can come up with maybe Aquinas's ways of talking about why that is so, but then I can, that also matches my experience. Yeah. Uh, and then if I can have that objective truth of Catholic teaching match my subjective experience, then I own it. Yeah, yeah, it becomes real, tangible, and possible to you. Not just I a Catholic thing I learned as yeah. a school kid or something. And I love the way you have that quote down from Love and Responsibility <clears throat> of Oitiwa, mm. which is a, a masterwork in human sexuality. Actually, it, as I was converting, someone introduced me to his thought I purchased that book and it was a key feature of my it's one conversion. Of the best books out there. Yeah, it was it, on human sexuality. Yeah, on, uh, yeah, and at the same time, there's a whole worldview that's communicated with the communication of sexuality, and so I would, I would, in a way, that and story of a soul of Saint Therese, I would credit <clears throat> with the two. Is that right? 
theoretical linchpins of my conversion. Well, yeah. it, was, uh, it was Hugh Hefner who said of Alfred Kinsey, if Kinsey is the prophet, I am his pamphleteer. And yeah. I think a response to this wicked uh, yeah. demonic teaching from Kinsey yeah. uh, is Wojtyla. Like if yeah. Wojty was the prophet, I want to be his pamphleteer. So wherever I would go to speak on pornography, that was the one book that I told everybody, Mormon, yeah. atheist, feminist, whatever, you need to read this yeah. book. I think if you read it, you you have to contend with what's communicated and it's so beautiful and has such a resonance of truth that you can't easily leave it aside. All right, I want you to talk about love and responsibility. Explain yeah. to me what you love about it because I hope that just from hearing you speak about it, people will be inspired to go pick it up. Okay, so let's set in the context that you just set up. In the Catholic tradition, historically, you have, you could say a third person objective description of the, the norm of human sexuality. Human sexuality is such that these things are normal in human behavior. We do well when we do them and we do badly when we don't. Mm -hmm. Now what Wojtyla does is he takes that Catholic tradition and he thinks through it phenomenologically and does so from the perspective of the person and personal experience. And he shows that this objective um, ethical description of human behavior shows up in our experience and we can in a way touch it in our experience so if we if we then move forward from there to the theology of the body in the catholic tradition you have the natural law mm -hmm. and the natural law of human sexuality put before us this is objectively correct now in theology of the body he puts before us the meaning of human sexuality and asks you to discover that meaning in your own experience yes. And so he speaks about rereading the language of the body, whereby you'll discover the spousal meaning of the body. And in the discover of this meaningfulness, you will be capacitated in your own experience to act out of that meaningfulness. Mm. And in a way, this will be accord then with the natural law objectively. So there's an appeal to the subject, there's an appeal to experience, so that you can ground down Catholic thought in your life yeah. and discover it as possible. And it, once you do so, it's beautiful. Like it's, he wrote Love and Responsibility in, in the late 50s, Theology of the Body in the 70s and promulgated in the early 80s. And they really are an answer to many of the ills in contemporary society. I suppose he wrote Theology of the Body in response to Humana Vitae and how Humana Vitae was received by the Catholic populace and those beyond. And yet it really is not just a response to the problem of contraception, but a response to same-sex attraction, a response to gender dysphoria, a response to many of the ills we're experiencing in contemporary society as such something really prophetic. What does the spousal meaning of the body mean? Uh, he doesn't ever define it with um, a succinct pithy formulation, but there are areas where he speaks about it in, in pithy ways. And one, one of those areas would, would be, it's the power to express love through self-gift, mm. whereby a communion of persons is formed out of which we can generate human life, new human persons. So the power to express love. It's our bodily ability to be gifts to one another, man to woman, woman to man, in a loving communion that is generative of life. Mm. And in Love and Responsibility has this great line, we must reconcile ourselves to the greatness of human sexuality. What is that? Say that again. We must reconcile ourselves to the greatness of human sexuality. There's a power contained in it for communion and life that's in a way so awesome that it's hard for us to grapple with it appropriately. Mm. We experience it in, we tend to try and treat it in ways casual because we can't grapple with its greatness. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. That's profound. Yeah. A, a wise older man once said to me, most people aren't afraid of what people do to them, but they're afraid of their own power, their own ability. And I think something of that is communicated love and responsibility. We, we want to debase and treat sexuality casually because we can't grapple with its greatness. It's like, I we know this firsthand in the way this past week with the birth of, of our boy Orrin. Mm. When he was born, there was such an experience of wonder. Mm. And to think that a, a sexual act, the conjugal act of myself and my wife, could bring about, with the help of God, this human person, 
who will now exist forever. It's just, it's too much. It's too great. It's easier to debase it. It is. It's yeah. the same thing with blasphemy and why we speak, yeah. uh, why we trivialize religious things. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's too big. It is. I remember when um, my wife gave birth to my eldest son, Liam. I remember seeing my wife breastfeed for the first time. And it was like my experience, to use that language, of her breastfeeding showed me in a very deep way the evil of pornography. Yeah. It was like once I saw yeah. the reality of her body and the beauty of it, yeah. pornography was disgusting. Disgusting yeah. to me. Does and that that's the kind of inoculation you need against it. It's one thing to know I shouldn't do this or mm -hmm. to be told you shouldn't do this, but it's a whole other thing to experience it yourself. Wow, this is this is not only something I shouldn't do, but this is awful. I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And you do experience something like that with childbirth with nursing. There's such a wonder to it. And the woman is really close to it. Us guys, it's just amazing to look on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You referred earlier to living maybe something of a hedonistic lifestyle yeah. and things like that. So how did John Paul II, when he was Wojtyla, by the way, for those at home, Wojtyla was his name before he became John Paul II, we're not talking about two different people. How did that kind of convert you um, in the realm of uh, sexuality? And Yeah. So I was suffering the consequences of my hedonistic lifestyle and I was crying out to God in prayer, began to explore the faith again and discovered it was answering various questions for me. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. And then this old priest gave me the catechism. And I started reading through it and it was like, it was like uh, water in a desert. It was, it was making sense of my life. But mm. the one area that remained insensible to me in Catholic thought was human sexuality. I was, I was troubled by this. I couldn't, I couldn't, see my way through to seeing the truth of it. I could accept it and you could mm. say obey it, but I couldn't see that it was true. Then I was introduced to love and responsibility. It was around the time that our Holy Father died in 2005. And as I began reading it, it was, it just answered all of those last questions. And before I'd even finished it, I was all in. This was like, I'm now going to give my life to the Catholic faith. There's no question about it. Every question is answered. I want what he is revealing in that text. Mm. Yeah. I love that idea. That's actually a pretty good argument for Christianity. The experience of everything making sense. Yeah. You know, you try to interpret yourself through a secular lens um, yeah. or many other different lenses. But then when you start to hear the truth of the Catholic faith, being like, oh my gosh, yeah, this is an instruction manual for something that makes sense of that thing. And I am that thing. Yeah. Therefore, I'm maybe without even understanding arguments for God's existence or proofs for the Catholic faith, since this lines up with my experience and makes sense of it in a way that my view of reality becomes broader and more coherent in a way that gives me freedom, I'm going to give myself to it. Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful description. Yeah, it's and like I, a... I thoroughly endorse it. <laughs> it is, it is. It, it's just, it's like, um, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that just comes together and then presents this beautiful picture. And yeah. we all as Catholics experience a struggle with God throughout the, the course of our Catholic life. And that, that struggle with God is in a way eased or to some degree answered by the fact that actually reality fits together for me and I can step forward now mm. and wrestle with God as I step forward because in a way, this jigsaw puzzle is showing me a beauty that I'm being drawn toward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about Edith Stein more, because I don't yeah. know a lot about her. I know a little bit about what she has to say about empathy, which my under if my understanding is correct, modern neuroscience is now validating. Did yeah. you ever get into that with mirror neurons and things like yeah, that? Yeah, I haven't gotten into it in a scholarly way, mm. but I am aware of the neurological research that's showing her, her concept of empathy is being confirmed mm -hmm. by neuroscience and is also helping some neuroscientists to develop their their yeah. neurology of, of empathy. You'd know more about it than me, yeah. but we'll talk about that in a second. But first of all, who was Edith Stein? I'd love, I know yeah. you're a, so, yeah, yeah. a devotee of hers. So. Yeah, so um, a German Jewess born in the 19th century to a, an Orthodox Jewish family. Her father died shortly after her birth and her mother took over the lumber business they had and, and ran it successfully afterwards. 
She was the last of 11 children. And as a child, she was incredibly precocious, very gifted in many areas, particularly in uh, learning. So her early schooling was was uh, an easy task for her. In her teenage years, she experienced at least agnosticism, if not atheism, and began and stopped stopped praying. And so in some way, inwardly distanced herself from the practice of the Jewish faith, Mm -hmm. though she continued to go to synagogue with her with her mother and continued to perform the outward observances. When she was um, in her early 20s, she went to university. Now in German, in Germany of her day, it was only recent that women were allowed to attend university. So she would have been in the first couple of generations of women attending German universities. And she studied, um, I've forgotten now, but she did find interest in psychology as well. Mm -hmm. Through that, she came across the logical investigations of Husserl and there discovered um, what she was searching in her search for the truth of reality. Through phenomenology, she began to approach questions of faith again, because phenomenology takes all questions without a priori resolution. I'll approach everything Mm -hmm. and think through it. And so phenomenology opens the way to thinking about angels as possible or God as possible and thinking about them. And then also she had many personal experiences of people with faith and began to move toward the Christian Catholic faith. Mm. In January 1st, 1922, she was baptized and immediately wished to enter the Carmelite order. But she had, I suppose, a public persona to some degree as a philosopher who studied under Husserl. Mm. And so she was recommended by her spiritual advisor to to stay in the world. And so she taught at a Dominican school for a number of years. Mm. Eventually, she taught at a Catholic pedagogical institute and had to give up her position there because uh, the Nazi regime had risen to, risen to power in Germany. And so she f- was finally released to enter the Carmel and she entered the Carmelite order in Cologne in 1934, I think, 1933-34. And the name she took? She took Theresia Benedicta Acruce, Teresa Blessed of the Cross or Blessed mm. by the Cross. And so she did devotion, devotion to Teresa of Avila. She read her work her autobiography, and this was a, a vivid moment of her conversion. And uh, she was also in some way devoted to St. John of the Cross and recognized in suffering and the Christian answer to the question of suffering, something of defined import. And interestingly, she was born on the Feast of Yom Kippur, mm. which is the Jewish day of mercy, their holiest day. And her mother at least thought that this in a way marked the course of Stein's, Stein's life. It begins to show up then in her own life and her own sufferings. And eventually she's martyred. She's taken from the Carmelite convent because the Catholic bishops in Holland published a pastor letter against Nazi socialism. She'd moved from Cologne to to Echt in Holland prior to this. And she was transported to Auschwitz and was gassed on August 9th, 1942. Mm. So she was a contemporary of Husserl. Yeah. And was his secretary. Yeah. How did she come into contact with him? And maybe you've already addressed this, but what was it specifically about his work that captured her? So, yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I just, she was studying German and history at university, but she did find interest in psychology and was going to do further studies in psychology. But the discipline of psychology was only a newly developed discipline at mm. the time. This was early 20th century. And during the course of her psychological studies, she, she read the second volume of Logical Investigations. And there she discovered the answer to her psychological questions and then also undergirding philosophical questions. So she moved from her home city university, Breslau, now modern day uh, Wroclaw, it's a Polish city today, but I can't Mm -hmm. pronounce it correctly, and moved to the university at which Husserl was teaching, Göttingen. Mm -hmm. And there she did doctoral studies under him on the problem of empathy Mm -hmm. and later became his secretary, collating his writings and, excuse me, Mm -hmm and um, preparing them for publication and also teaching new students phenomenology. Husserl was a great thinker, but he wasn't um, easy to understand as a, as a student. So many of his uh, early uh, students like Stein and Adolf Reinach would have taught introductory classes in phenomenology so that students could then enter into the Husserlian way of understanding philosophy. Mm. What's yeah. the problem of empathy? What did she mean by it? Yeah. so. When you begin with the subject, you then have a question. 
what is our relationship to the world and what is our relationship to other subjects. And so in phenomenology, you have this focused attention to me as the personal subject experiencing the objective world. But Stein recognized that a key feature of our experience of reality are other personal subjects experiencing the world together with us. Mm. And so for her then, the act of empathy is my experience of you as an experiencing subject. So if we set up a, something of a problem, I could be in this room and notice a lot of objects mm -hmm. and I could from you and Thursday's actions infer you're a unique kind of object. You're different than all the other objects. You're a personal subject. You're moving like me, mm. you're looking like me, you're talking like me. But for Stein, actually our experience of one another as subjects is much more immediate. Mm -hmm. I don't <coughs> form a rational That's argument. Right. Matt is moving his arm, Matt is looking in this way. I immediately experience you as living like me and as experiencing the world. So right now, I see you seeing me. That's the act of empathy. Mm. I experience you experiencing the world, yeah. in this case, seeing me. And so this then becomes, you could say, absolutely central to Stein's thought. And it seems to me also, in a way, to Husserlian thought. And later in his works, he writes about empathy and a particularly defined reference to it in his Cartesian Meditations one of his last published works. Mm. So for Stein then, um, our experience of the life world, of the world of experience is uniquely, has a unique feature, this experience of other subjects experiencing the world. And without that, we can't really engage properly with one another. Like, um, let's take a funny example. Just say I was to treat you and Nick as mere objects. Thursday. Sorry, Thursday. You, you treated him like an object then by misnaming him, I think. That's, that's not my real name either, so. <laughs> yeah, just so people know we're trying to hide his identity. You, so yeah. say you treated me and Thursday like what? Uh, as mere objects. Like mm -hmm. just say I was walking down the corridor and, and you and Thursday were standing in the corridor and you, I just pushed you aside. Right. There'd be a problem. I'd have yeah. a moral problem. Yeah. But if I was walking down the corridor and there were two chairs in my way and I pushed them aside, there's no problem. Mm -hmm. The chairs are mere objects, but you're personal subjects. And so I have to experience you as a personal subject to act rightly in relation to you. Mm -hmm. I can't just push you aside. Empathy is what gives us others as personal subjects. Gives us what? Gives us the other as a personal yeah. subject. Yeah. You're experiencing the world like me, and then mm -hmm. I'm gonna act in relation to you in very different ways than I'll act in relation to everything else. Then think of this in relation to human sexuality. Yeah, well, first of all, before we get to the human sexuality, yeah. Uh, to think of it this way, it's not that I'm not using you because I need an episode for my show. Yeah. Like I am, I'm using yeah. you, but I'm not using you merely. Yeah, is that the distinction as a means to an end? Like if I said to you, pass me. I mean, and maybe I'm yeah. wrong here. I'd love you to yeah. correct me. But if I said, pass me the cup, yeah. I am using you to pass me the cup. Or yeah. I am. I need to. I am in a sense using my wife to bear children because I don't have that ability and I desire it. Yeah. But the problem isn't when you use people. The, the 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 problem is when you don't when you subordinate their dignity to whatever it is you yeah. want affected. Maybe or yeah. do I have that wrong? Yeah, yeah. And this this shows up wonderfully in Voitiva and love and responsibility. And in a way, Stein's um, understanding of empathy is somewhat an undergirding structure for that. Voitiva didn't read Stein before Love and Responsibility. Mm. But at the same time, when you read their works together, you see many strands that can be drawn between them. Yeah. But yeah, so if you asked me to pass pass you the beer, you would be using me to pass you the beer. But you're not treating me as a mere object. Right, because that's very different to you yeah. pushing me out of the way. Yeah, yeah, it is. But, but also it, you could like, or let, let's set up a slightly different example. If you were a general, this is in, in love and responsibility. If you were a general in an army, mm -hmm. you're sending your troops into a battle. You could send them in using them as mere objects, cannon fodder for the battle. Or your relationship to, to them could be differently. You could be the one who's coordinating the battle and they, your soldiers, also want to win the battle. Mm. So all of you as personal subjects, you've chosen our aim is winning the battle here. We have a shared end. We have a shared end. And that's the key feature. Personal subjects choose ends in their actions. And when we act in relation to one another, we have to be cognizant of one another's ends. Mm -hmm. And when we act together, when we use one another, we have to agree upon the end we're doing, 
we're, we're, we're using one another for the sake of. And then it's not mere use, using one another as objects, but it's treating one another as personal subjects. Hey, I want to say thank you to the greatest prayer and meditation app in the history of prayer and meditation apps. You know what I'm talking about. Hallo, as in H-A-L-L-O-W. Check this out. They've got sleep stories. You can learn how to pray the rosary. They have audio books. Um, they have my lo-fi instantly, but check this out. You can even let Dr. Scott Hahn put you to sleep <laughs> at night. Not because he'll come over to your house and strangle you. That'd be weird. Although for the right price. Check this out. Good evening. Oh, come on. And welcome to tonight's Bible story. Do you hear the rain in the background? My name is Dr. Scott Hahn. You will not be able to listen to the first three minutes or pass the first three minutes because you will fall asleep. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. The reason you should go over there and sign up as opposed to downloading it on Apple is twofold. Number one, you get three months for free and you get access to the entire app. So if after three months you don't like it, you can just cancel. The second reason is you don't give any of your money to Apple. And, you know, why give more money to them when you can give it to Hello? Hello.com slash Matt Frad. Also, go <laughs> hello.com slash Matt. Go check them out so they know that I sent you. Second thing I want to tell. Let's blue pad scoot and clear and do Martin. Second thing I want to do is tell you to become a supporter over on mattfrad.locals.com. The reason I migrated from Patreon over to Locals is Locals is a free speech community that's not going to ban me for kicking against secular dogma. When you go over to mattfrad.locals.com and become a supporter, here's some of the things that you get. You get morning coffee podcasts with yours truly. You get access to a very energetic online community. What's cool about Locals is not just me posting and you responding, you as a local get to post yourself and engage an amazing Catholic community. You'll get, if you become an annual supporter over at mattfrad.locals.com, quarterly newspapers. That's right. I am in the newspaper business and it's costing me way too much money, but that's okay. Read all about it. It looks really good, actually, these newspapers. There's Catholic comics and articles and poetry. That's a duco. A Sudoku, sometimes two Sudokus. And anyway, we mail it to your door, even if you live in Yemen, New Zealand, or anywhere, Not really. Not the moon. We, we don't mail it to the moon. We don't mail it to the moon, but we do pay for shipping uh, if you become an annual supporter. You'll also get access to bonus interviews that we do that we don't release on YouTube. You'll get monthly audio books. You'll get online courses. We have Dr. Ed Fazer leading an exclusive course on the five ways. Dr. Chad Englund leading a course on Augustine's Confessions. You get there's so much that I give you. For example, we have weekly comedy sketches now from Australian comedian and Catholic James McCann. James Donald Forbes McCann of the James Donald Forbes McCann Catamaran <laughs> Plan Podcast. <laughs> it's really cool. So go sign up over there, please, and you'll get the full pints with Aquinas uh, experience, and you will ensure that Thursday will continue to be paid. <laughs> please sign up. <laughs> <laughs> Mafrad.locals.com back to the show does it does it return to use if you deceive the other like if if the person like if if you thought like if you were in the example of the battle if you were to say like you tell the, a specific group of soldiers that they're important to winning the battle but you are actually using like that platoon as cannon fodder yeah like you're just using them as cannon fodder and you don't make them aware mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. like it, you could perceive a situation in a particularly awful war where you could tell them like, yeah, you're 90% of you are probably going to die. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I am using you for cannon fodder for yeah. the greater good. And if they, if they, you know, are okay with that, then that's a separate issue. But if you don't tell them that, is that yeah. return to the issue of use? I'm, I'm just yeah. trying to track Nick, here. you set that up wonderfully. You said oh, oh very good. <laughs> Thursday, you set that up wonderfully. You name Nick. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not my name. Like, we're not <laughs> trying to, like, if it was my name, we'd just be like, yep, yeah, don't say that again. But it's not my name. <laughs> no, no. I'll give out your number later. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, he's a good looking chap. Um, no, so that's it exactly. There has to be a coordinated cognition of the end and choice of it for the act to be properly personal. Yeah. Uh, or at least the the soldiers should be choosing that as their end, the winning of the battle. But the general could well revert into a into um, a situation where it would become immoral when he uses them in the example you gave, like cannon fodder, pure cannon fodder. 
rather than I know 90% of you're going to die, but we're fighting for our homeland here. And this is important. We all want this. Mm. I'm going to coordinate what's happening. I don't will your destruction, yeah. but I foresee it. Yeah. Yeah. And, th- and that that's different. Then. Now, the other thing is we can, we can both agree to engage in an activity for a bad end. Yeah. You know, so it's like, well, it's okay if both parties consented. Well, yeah. it depends what they consented to, because if two people consent to fornicate, they've, in yeah. a way, in a way, you're going to have to be really careful here, but in a way that's worse. Yeah. Like both people are choosing evil. Yeah. So let, let's give the, a, the principle of Oitiwa to, to clarify that. Yeah. So um, you, you said earlier that the, the only proper response to a person is love. That's like a positive formulation of what's called the personalistic norm. Mm. A negative formulation would be when I act in relation to another, I must remember that he or she has, or at least should have, his or her ends. Then qualifier, of course, that end must be a true good. If the action is to be moral, both the end has to be true and we have to coordinate ourselves with respect to that end. So if a woman approaches a uh, videographer and says, I am, I would like to uh, be a pornography performer and you have the means to make that happen and could you please help me? Yeah. And they both agree to that. What happens? What is that? Yeah, that would be a, a bad end. They would be not using one another in an impersonal way, but they would be aiming at an incorrect end together. Mm. Augustine would have a wonderful phrase for that, oh, friendship unfriendly. Mm. So we, we, we desire for, I think as human, friendship above and beyond everything. Friendship is the context. We seek the happiness of God that Aquinas has so mm. eloquently set forth. And we must choose good friendships. And those friendships are the ones that aim at good ends, not false, merely apparently good ends. Then we've problem. When you teach theology of the body, how do you distinguish between, I mean, apart from the fact that they're one is a series of speeches and one is more of a philosophical work, do you distinguish between the theology of the body and love and responsibility, or do you just sort of lump it all under the title TOB? Yeah, when I teach it, I, I usually teach it in two parts, love and responsibility first, and then the man and woman he created mm. in the theology of the body proper. Is that sort of how part. like philosophy needs to undergird theology? Yeah, is it the same thing? that's kind the of? way I conceive of it. I like that. Yeah. yeah, and in a way, love and responsibility, it's a complex work, but it's easier to enter into because it's so experientially grounded, whereas when you enter into the theology of the body, because you're performing a, a biblical theological analysis, it's a little bit more distant from you. And so there's a mm. certain respect in which, at least I under, how I understand it is, you have to come to grips with human sexuality in your own person first and do so through love and responsibility to be able to properly engage with the theology of the body. Because sex isn't distant from, it, distant from us. Like, you're a man, I'm a man. Nick is a man. Yep. And, um, you know, we have it as, an exp- as a, a key aspect of our experience throughout all of our lives. So love and responsibility is just a concerted reflection on that, yeah. laying it out appropriately. And then when you come to grips with it, then the theology of the body is like luminous. Mm. It glows. I'm thinking of this excellent line in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which, correct me if I'm wrong, feels like a phenomenological statement about a objective thing and it's when it has to do with chastity it says um the alternative is clear either man governs his passions and so finds peace or he allows himself to be dominated by them and becomes unhappy yeah yeah wonderful line Mm. yeah um in the theology of the body the way he sets that up is we tend to want to master human sexuality externally contraception Mm -hmm. take mastery over the natural powers of the body rather than mastering ourselves inwardly. And it seems to communicate the very same truth. Yeah, And it really is, it seems to me, when I, the more and more I thought and, um, and worked with the text, that that was a central mm. uh, principle of it. Like we're, we're, we're reluctant to master ourselves because of the difficulty involved. Mm. And we want to grapple with the greatness of sexuality from the outside. Mm. I'll make this impotent by some external act rather than I'll take hold of my own desires and focus them appropriately. I find when talking to older children about human sexuality and certain sexual sins, an analogy to food is really helpful. Yeah. Uh, Especially when children understand that, say certain children have had a really bad diet and they're clearly obese. And and you say, well, 
what's wrong with that if he wants to eat whatever he wants or whatever she wants to eat? What, why is it a problem? And they can kind yeah. of tell you why. And yeah. here we do get to that idea of if I do whatever I want, what I want may not be ultimately what I want because it's yeah. to my detriment. Um, yeah. And the same is true in the sexual realm. And it won't make you happy. And that's, the, yeah. that's, and that's, that's so good. Like that's not, that's not a modern talking point, right? No. Like Aquinas, when he talks of happiness, what he, what he means is the fulfillment of our nature. So you yeah. should do whatever yeah. makes you happy. Yeah. But what that is, is yeah. virtuous acting out. Yeah. You could take a, with a God. list of the, the Catholic issues and say, the church is saying, cause it won't make you happy. Yeah. Because it won't make you happy. Yeah. And I remember I had this memory that just came to me. I was inside of my house in Australia as a teenager, and I overheard my mum's friend saying to a relative who was my age, who was thinking of shacking up with her boyfriend, well, yeah, do whatever makes you happy. Yeah. That's what we say to each other. Do whatever makes you happy. Yeah. I think of the, uh, the quote from St. John Bosco. What did to he his orf he he ran that orphanage. It's, that was his great act of uh, sanctity. Was that beautiful orphanage? He used to tell his boys when they would ask him what he should, what they, you know, the, mm. Don, what should I do today? Whatever you want, just don't sin. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't, I don't mean to drive a hard distinction between Thomism and phenomenology. Yeah. But like that sounds more like the kind of at least the manualist approach, you yeah. know, like. Don't sin. Yeah. Uh, okay. Why? And then you would have to say, yeah. well, because it, have you done it? Yes. How did you experience that three minutes after fruition, say, you know? Yeah. And you're like, well, it made me feel miserable. Okay. Is that the kind yeah. of marriage between phenomenology and Thomism that we want to see? Or, yeah. or would a Thomist say, no, it's already there in Thomas. Uh, in Thomas. We don't need it. Yeah. In some way, there's an authentic good being performed when we set philosophical traditions or schools or movements in contrast to one another and do a comparison. But often what happens there is you get a highly polarized comparison. And in my work with Stein and Aquinas, I've attempted to, in a way, travel the opposite path. In what way can these be reconciled mm. in ways that are fruitful to both? Mm. And so when Stein takes up Aquinas's thought, she takes it up in her own words as a reverent and willing pupil. Mm. And yet she's not going to sit passively before his concepts and just receive them and attempt to understand them. She's really going to think through them. And the way she thinks through them is she does phenomenology with his concepts. Mm. And in this way, then she'd go, yes, that concept yes. gives me reality luminously, or I need to adjust that concept yes. or, whoa, that concept is problematic. I need to correct it. And so she'll she'll take it all reverently, willingly, but she'll think her way through it phenomenologically and then confirm it, adjust it. I mean, isn't it. that the only way we learn anything? It, according to sign, that's the only way to be a philosopher, at least. So, a, an historian of philosophy could grapple with the Thomistic schema, present it coherently, and that's sufficient. Mm -hmm. But for a philosopher, no, I have to think my way through it. Yeah. I have to see if it's true. And phenomenology helps me to bring the concept back to the thing and go, yes, that brings that reality before me luminously. Mm. And if it does, I leave it alone. This is why children are sometimes the best philosophers, because they don't have the language yeah. to say the thing objectively, correctly. Yeah. They say it as it appears to them. Yeah. My son Peter and I were at a wedding in Minnesota several months back, and there was, um, what do they call it, heat lightning or heat? Yeah. Sheet lightning? No, heat lightning. What's that called when, you, when you've kind of got like lightning in the distance, but it's, I don't know. Heat lightning? Is that the wrong way? Of, I don't know. I'm going to Google heat lightning. It's probably not a thing at all. But do you know what I mean? Like when it's, yeah. when you're not seeing direct lightning, but it's like flashes yeah. all over the place. So my point was just that Peter looked at that and went, dad, come here. And I got down like, what is it, buddy? He went, it looks like the sun's running all over the place. It's one of the most beautiful things a human being has ever said to me. Yeah. I almost have tears in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Heat lightning or silent lightning or summer lightning or dry lightning. Yes. I got um, it right. I got it right well objectively. Done. But Peter got it right. That sometimes call is simply cloud to ground lightning that occurs far away with thunder that dissipates before it reaches the observer. Yeah. At night, it is possible to see flashes of lightning from very far distances. But the sound does not carry that far. Or the sun... 
running all over the place. The like that's another way of place. saying that thing. Yeah, and Peter I just, gave I a basic that. phenomenological description of the experience for right, him. Right, and right. then it, with your conceptual knowledge, you can help him unpack it. Mm -hmm. This is what's happening there, Peter. But mm -hmm. it doesn't undo the original experience. It's like, that's still true. Mm -hmm. Now, I once gave a talk in Baltimore yep. at the Basilica, I think it was. And it was on pornography. And a, a quote unquote sex worker was there. I would never say that that's work. But... Um, Someone was there and they raised their hand and they were, a, they, God bless her and save her. She was a pornography performer, a prostitute, these sorts of things. And she got up to tell me, to kind of challenge me. And I was super okay with that. And she said, you're painting people in the porn industry as helpless victims, but you have to understand, like, I'm very happy doing this. And my response was, you're wrong to be. Like yeah. you're wrong to be happy, yeah, yeah. which is something that just sounds yeah. so, it, it just rings bad against our ears in this modern age. But it's like, yeah. I mean, but I think we, we've all had that experience, right? Or, or especially women. I, I, women seem to resonate with this more when I've shared it than, than men. But, you know, a woman might say, I know a friend and she's with this guy and he's bad for her. She's not herself when she's around him. Um, her, her personality isn't in full bloom kind of thing. But when I, when I approach her, she'll say, but I love him. I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. And in that context, you can see why it might be right. Yeah. Like, well, you're, you're wrong to be. Yeah. I suppose yeah. the question there is what, what is true happiness? And at least for the Catholic theological and philosophical tradition, true happiness is the authentic and full flourishing of what it means to be human. And of course we can get happiness in fragmentary ways mm -hmm. and in things that aren't actually helpful for us. Like the fourth donut, I really could have left aside. It's not tempered to go for the fourth donut, but right now for the next five minutes. Unless you're trying to gain weight, which Thursday is trying to do. He brought in a box of donuts this morning and said, want one? I said, get behind me, Nick. For you, for you. You caught me, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> Old Nick there. For you, Nick, uh, that fourth donut is perhaps good, but for me, in my own context, it would no longer be good. Just to be clear, Thursday did not eat four donuts. Yeah, I didn't eat four donuts. I <laughs> and in doing that, I have vindicated you and have brought this back to Thursday before you accidentally become Nick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, what, what is happiness? It's it's not a fleeting emotion. Right. It's it's not it's, it's not, not subjective mere emotional contentment. State. No, it's it's the full flourishing of what it means to be human. Right. And for Aristotle, that was to live in accord with right reason. And, and one could think of this as a kind of clinical description, but reason shows us reality. Reality becomes manifest for reason and included in reality is the good. So the good becomes manifest for reason. So do I want what is truly good? Then I'll search it out and I'll try and live in accord with it. If I don't, I'm doing something by definition unreasonable. That's not truly good but this part of me wants it. I'll satisfy that part for a short period of time, but in the end will degrade in my happiness in mm -hmm. general. And so it really is sensible to act in accord with right reason. The whole life of virtue is to live in accord with right reason. And it's basically simply the, the same as saying to attain what is truly good, what is truly good, because reason will show that for us. Mm -hmm. So the theologian calls sin what the moral philosopher might call unreasonableness. So yeah. the two mean the same thing. Yeah. And you think like Aquinas is like kind of like a he would gel with this idea when he says that whenever we act, we act for at least a perceived good. It yeah. may or may not be, but yeah. this idea, and I'd love you to put some flesh on this, that you have never done anything intentionally in your life that didn't in some way seem good. Yeah. He says, I think that even the person who commits yeah. suicide perceives the good yeah. of not suffering. Yeah. So something objectively evil is taking place, but it wasn't chosen for the objective evil. Yeah. And you say, well, okay, but what if somebody does something to kind of give the middle finger to God? Yeah. Okay, but like even that is perceived as a good, perhaps to um, establish one's autonomy uh, or freedom. Yeah. Like even that, I'm perceiving something as good but I'm, I'm wrong. What yeah. Do you, what do you yeah. Think? For, for Aquinas, the, the, the object of the will is the good and reason presents to the will, the good, and there, oh. thereby specifies what we can choose. So it doesn't make sense for Aquinas that the will would make any movement if it 
there is not a good before it. And then the question becomes ethical. Well, is this a real good or an apparent good? Is it true or is it merely apparent and in fact false? And we can be incredibly mistaken about that. Or we can also see this is a merely apparent good. It's actually false. But right now I'm going to take an exception because I really want it. But for Aquinas, yeah, the will's movement is toward the good, period. It's like the eye sees color, the will wants the good. Mm. But is it a false good? That's the question. It reminds you of Chesterton's line, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. Like yeah. the mind is made for truth. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a really compelling view because then when we speak to our contemporaries who don't adhere to the faith or perhaps think philosophically about matters, you can appeal to their experience. Mm -hmm. Like your aunt who um, liked this guy who made her happy but was really bad for her. You can say, well, I see you're seeking some good here. Mm -hmm. I see you're seeking yes. some fragment of happiness. Yes. Now, what I want for you is a more full picture of happiness. And because this is impeding you, you're actually closed off to this fuller picture. And so, again, I, I sorry to cut yeah. you off, but again, I think of the child, right, who only wants to eat ice cream. Like yeah. we could say to our slightly older children, what about the kid who only wants ice cream, who thinks this will make them happy? Can you understand why they would think that? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Will it? No. How would the child respond to the parent who said to them, you may not only eat ice cream, they would be angry. Why would they be angry? Because it would appear that they're yeah. taking away something that's good. Okay. So when we look at God's commandments towards us in yeah. the realm of sexuality or in yeah. any other realm, could, could it be the case yeah. that God loves us and sin hurts us? As Ralph Martin says, sin always hurts. Sin never helps. Yeah. Yeah. That's... This yeah. is a great way to start talking to our kids about this. Stuff. Yeah, and p parenting actually teaches you an awful lot, an awful lot about life. Like when we think of parents, we primarily think of them as doing the education. But when I'm with my kids, I'm learning as much about myself as I'm learning as they're learning from me. Oh my gosh! And they're that's teaching so true. you about yourself, and they're yeah. teaching you about God, and they're teaching you. They're giving you an analogies to the whole of reality, reminding you how to be human. Yeah, like, like Peter when he saw that the yeah. flashing lightning. Like sometimes we just pass those things by and we don't notice them anymore. And then a kid will go with open eyes. Look at that. Love wow. kids so much. Yeah. And Peter does have eyes of wonder. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. He's terrific. All of my kids are terrific. Terrific in different ways. Yeah. They're yeah. Great neighbors to have. Yeah, indeed. Um, what light bulbs go off when, by the way, Dr. Rob McNamara teaches at Franciscan University of Steubenville. So when you send your children here, he'll be one of the excellent uh, professors that you'll get if you send them here. What are some of the light bulbs that go off with your students as you begin to talk about this? I mean, they've been raised in a pornified culture. They may have heard yeah. fragments of what the church teaches about human sexuality. But what are some of the things that when you delve into it, people are like, yes, the scales fall from their eyes, yeah. as it were? I'll, I'll go through them in terms of what first occurred to me, but they might not be in the order of importance. Sure. One of the things is what we already talked about, recognizing that what a theologian calls sin, a philosopher calls acting unreasonably. And once you see that, it unpacks in a way Catholic teaching in an undergirding way. Mm -hmm. Oh, this, I'm advised not to do, I'm commended not to do this and commended to do that because that's actually untrue, unreasonable. And that's true and that's reasonable. And that gives them a sort of rest in the Catholic faith. Okay, I can, I can see these things for myself if I impact them properly. Another thing is, is reading the writings of Augustine. So in many of our courses, in the undergraduate courses, we teach them chronologically mm. for the most part. And Augustine often appears in that chronology. And his work, Confessions, is like a masterwork in what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And so for them to see um, philosophical problems show up in this you could say ancient journal is mm -hmm. is really compelling for them. Like that quote I gave you earlier, friendship unfriendly or or my one joy was to love and be loved. Like everyone can reconcile themselves to these states. Wasn't confessions like the first autobiography? Isn't that generally understood to be Yeah. If if it isn't, it's definitely the principal yeah. autobiography. I um, wanted to do a quick shout out to locals. We have a seven part series on the confessions by Dr. Chad Engeland. Okay. Um, from, I think, the University of Dallas. So people, if they become a supporter over there, they can get access to that. That is one of the greatest books that has ever been written. It is. It is. You could read it. And it's so, it's yeah. so, it feels like it was written yesterday. Yeah. 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 And yeah. indeed, what we talked about earlier, that turn toward the subject that appears in the modern era, that already began with Augustine. Mm -hmm. You already have the seeds of that in Augustine. And mm -hmm. so the turn toward the subject is not 
un-Catholic. That's a lovely train. I know, we hear it here all the time. I've kind of stopped hearing it. There's a train in the distance. What was was funny is I remember doing an interview and hearing that train blaring its horn. I'm like, for goodness sake, why do they have to blare it so many times? Like, it's so abrasive. And then someone who watches the show, who I guess manages a train, wrote to me and showed me the very... Like the the legal the things that yeah. they why yeah. they have to blast it so okay. many times. Like, all right, fair enough. <laughs> and maybe your listeners like it because it grounds down what we're doing here concretely. <laughs> yeah. But so um, we're doing it in a dead steel town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. One of the other things that we really um, is light bulb for students is when we look at Aquinas on the presence of God. So at the in the opening questions of the Summa Theologiae, question eight. After he's proven the existence of God and a certain subset of his attributes, he speaks about how God is present. Mm. And often this question is passed over because we're really interested in presenting who God is from a philosophical perspective and his, you know, that he is and, and his attributes. And we're less inclined to show his intimate relation to created reality. But as they begin to grapple with how intimately God is present to all things, including themselves as, a, as one of his creatures, it really unlocks for them the depth of reality. And so for Aquinas, God is present by his being or essence because from him all things have come. Mm -hmm. He's present by his power because he is the first cause of all activity and created reality. And he's present by knowledge and by love because he sees all and he loves all to be. And there is in a way no distance between him and created reality, even though he's utterly distinct from it. And to just think about his intimacy, how close he is to me. And then this makes sense of them of sense for them of Augustine's phrase, God is more inward to me than my innermost self. And he really is. He sees me more than I see myself. He understands me better than I understand myself. He loves me more than I love myself. He wills me to be more than I will myself to be. And it's like he's there whispering, be, be, or be Matt, be Rob, be Thursday. (laughs) <laughs> be yourself, you know, be the creature I've made you to be. Mm-hmm. And for this, or at least my students just take to it like ducks to water. They love it. Mm-hmm. And it's, it unpacks prayer for them. When they sit down to prayer, it's not like they have to um, put just, themselves mm-hmm. in the presence of God. They have to just go, oh, actually, I'm already in the presence of God and I have mm-hmm. to recognize it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. What about in terms of human sexuality? Are there things that you teach that resonate? I think, I'm sure there are, but yeah, are yeah. I think for them, it goes back to the, what we talked about in relation to experience. Yeah. They begin to recognize that what they've held to be true mm-hmm. throughout their Catholic life is actually the case and they can feel through it themselves. It becomes tangible for them. Like when you, when you step through love and responsibility, read it together, discuss it together, and then step through the theology of body in the same way. It can't but appeal to your heart Mm -hmm. and you you feel that tug and it in a way, I think like you had in in relation to the experience of pornography, I don't want that. I want that over there. I want marriage, family. Mm. I want to see my wife nurse. I want to see my children born. I want to see them grow up. Yeah. You know, when my wife first heard about the theology of the body, um, being a choleric, are you familiar with the temperance? Yeah. yeah. Right. So cholerics tend to, one of their first kind of responses at an injustice is anger. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> so my wife uh, was watching these videotapes because um, she was sick and she had a bunch of time on her hands and she found some tapes and she played them. It was Christopher West talking about the theology of the body. Her immediate oh. response at this truth, yeah. anger. Yeah. And namely, why did nobody tell me yeah. this? Yeah, yeah. But again, maybe what Christopher was doing was inviting her internal experience to meet what the church's yeah. teachings were. And when yeah. they came together, she finally saw it. Yeah, yeah. And then, then you, you wonder, like we, we have such a wonderful wealth of teaching in the Catholic faith and you wonder why we're not more forward with it, why, why it's not more known. Why, like I grew up in a Catholic country, why did I in my 20s have to discover the Catholic faith in a way for the first time? I knew mm-hmm. it devotionally growing up, I had a prayer life, and what I, recon- what I recognize now was actually a, quite a wonderful prayer life. It, I recognized that actually when I tried to pray in my 20s and realized this is actually quite difficult. Mm. What was I doing when I was a kid when it was so easy? Mm. Oh, wow, there's something here that, and I've distanced myself from it greatly. But um, when, we, when you enter into the wealth of it, you do, you do experience something of, why didn't I know this? 
And in a way, when I converted, that was part of my impetus to teach because others should know this. Other mm -hmm. other young men, other boys, they, they need to know this growing up. Because maybe if you had, you wouldn't have ended up in the in the place you ended up in and suffered so much. So just, I want to circle back to Stein before we wrap up, because here's, here's, because yeah. when I was doing a lot of writing on pornography, I was learning more about mirror neurons, right? Yeah. And so I guess neuroscientists have been talking about these maybe for the last 15 years or so. And it's the idea that when I experience, let's say pornography, right? Like if I watch pornography, my brain doesn't make the distinction, even though in one sense, I understand that I'm not participating in this act. Yeah. My body receives the experience as if I were. Yeah. And so the analogy I like to give is uh, men often understand this. If you go to a, I don't know, some sort of sports game and a man is hit in a tender area. Yeah. It, men react as if they were hit in yeah. that tender area. And my understanding of Stein, am I saying, is it Stein or Stein? Forgive yeah, me. So Stein English, I'm trying to Stein be, German. Okay, but I'm trying to be I, fancy. I go between the two because okay. I just don't ever remember which yeah well you correct me if i'm wrong but my understanding was that she says and also when we think of empathy we often think of i feel your pain kind of thing but hers is her understanding is broader than that right it's like i feel your jubilation it's not just yeah. pain yeah but that she says something or she seems to mean i don't deduce from your facial expressions that you are in pain yeah R remind myself what that was like last time i was also in that state and then sympathize with that yeah but i'm actually experiencing your pain yeah. your jubilation yeah. and if i'm right in that then that really does seem to modern neuroscience really seems to confirm that Rather bizarre insight in a way. Yeah. yeah. So let's track through what you said there. So um yeah, you're you're at a you're at a stadium or you're watching on TV and you see the athlete hurt in, in his masculinity <laughs> and then you you <laughs> wince. What you're doing is you're experiencing his experience of the pain. And so what she says is it's primordial for the athlete. And it's non-primordial for me. It's not my pain, mm. but it's con-primordial. I'm in a way experiencing it together with you. Now, that doesn't mean I have the pain in myself. I don't experience the pain directly. I see. But I do experience you experiencing pain and can relate myself to it. And as you said, this is not a deductive. It's not an inference from an argument. It's like an immediate experience. And interestingly enough, some of the problems with understanding empathy is that I see you experiencing pain and I experience the pain together with you. That would be to conflate the subjects. Mm. We're no longer two separate subjects, but we're now one thing experiencing pain, you directly, me indirectly. First, I know you retain your, your separation mm. of subjects. Mm. I see you and I experience you experiencing that pain. And in a way it relates me to you as a subject and keeps our independence. I see. There's a kind of unity and distinction maintained in it. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Uh, in the Summa, Thomas talks about five remedies for sorrow. Yeah. And one of them is to share with a friend mm. what you're experiencing. Yeah. And he says, this relieves or assuages sorrow for two reasons. The first is, he says, when I see you experience experiencing my pain and being saddened by it, yeah. I'm reminded that I'm loved, Yeah, which is just a yeah. beautiful yeah. thing. The second thing he says is, it, it, I, in sharing my burden with you, it's like you help me carry this weight. And so I'm not carrying yeah. the full force of it on yeah. my own. Yeah, I would say that Stein's understanding of empathy shows up there. Mm. And I would say that there's a certain respect in which you can understand empathy as undergirding the possibility of love. Like if I don't, if I don't know that you're another personal subject experiencing the world and I think you're an object, I love you for me. But if I know that you're another personal subject, I can love you for you. And empathy is what gives mm. me you as another personal subject. So without empathy, no personal love. And, and you, you, you see this in friendship in like in the ways that friends share life together and can co-experience one another's sorrow, one another's joy. Without that, what would what would be the the vivid heart mm. of friendship? It would be we'd we'd be isolated from one another. Yeah. And then if you think of marriage, like um, you 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 experience the joy of the other in you, and they experience your joy in them. Yeah. You know, it's like there's such an interweaving of mm -hmm. life that happens through this, and without empathy, not possible. Yeah. yeah.
That's why when you when say Aristotle or Aquinas borrowing from him would say to love is to will the good of the other. It's important yeah. that you tack on to the end of that sentence for the sake of the other. Yeah. Because if I will, if a man wills the good of his wife, let's say he wants her to eat well and get in shape. Yeah. But suppose he wants that good for his sake yeah. so that he can find her more lust worthy or something like yeah. that. This isn't love. Yeah. So in that sense, to will the good of the other. Yeah. Well, you might not actually be loving. I need to will the good of the other for the sake of the other, not from, for what I get from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the arrow of love has to terminate in the other for it to be, for it to be about the other. And, but at the same time, it, it doesn't make your loving of the other for your sake problematic. So, mm. so when Aristotle and Aquinas formulate that, that definition of love, it, it, in the text itself, it's actually to love is to will the good of someone, mm-hmm. that someone being yourself or the other. And so you can see how this reconciles then with the theological tradition. Christ said, you must love the Lord your God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. So there's a certain mm. respect in which love of self is the principle of love of the other. Not that it's the love of the other is derivative of your love of self, but you see, oh, you're another just like me. And you identify with the other and take them to yourself. Mm. I will will your good just like I will my own. And then in a way, my will, so to speak, leaves myself and inhabits you and seeks your good just like I seek my own. And unless we enter into relationships like this, we really do remain isolated from one another. So, um, and yet at the same time, to love your wife is not only to love her for her own sake, but it's also to love her for your sake. Mm -hmm. Like your wife wants to be desired by you. I see. I see. You know, you, you, there's 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 a unique coming together of right of, of a love of the other for oneself. I right. want you because if me. I just want her good for her sake, in a way, there's yeah. no re, re, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's the word? She, I'm she, yeah. Yeah. Reciprocity. Thank you. Yeah. There's no reciprocity there. It's like she's, I like I could exist on a different country and just yeah. orchestrate events in her life so that she flourishes. Yeah, and she doesn't know about me. No, but, but no, she wants to be wanted by me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And th- that's a unique interweaving of life. She wants to be wanted by you. You want to be wanted by her. Mm-hmm. And you also want to want one another's good. And if if the balancing of these things goes out of kilter, then you have various different. So, kinds of problems. Um, what's it like? How do you recognize in yourself when you? perhaps at times have ceased to want the good of your wife for her sake or something like that. I mean, I yeah. mean, cause I mean, most people experience this, but having, I mean, you teach this stuff yeah. and you've studied this stuff. So what's yeah, yeah. it like for you when yeah. you experience yourself, not loving your wife or children? Yeah. It, it seems to me to come along with a kind of self-consciousness. So I become kind of, um, more aware of myself, my own needs and, it takes me away from my awareness of my wife and my kids and their mm. needs. And we don't really need this self-consciousness to adequately love ourselves. By nature, we want our good. We want our own good. And so that can, in a way, move along with a kind of automatic character to it. Mm. But I need to be, in a way, attentive to those around me. And my the focus point of my life has to, in a way, rest in them if I'm not to, to become self-conscious, self-centered, and so I notice it with self-consciousness. Um, and at the same time, I, a kind of sadness sets in with that. Like, it seems to me that when one is really conscious of oneself, one is also at the same time not abundantly living. I'm mm. like more depressed, not clinically, but the world is a, is a grayer place. And when my consciousness is out there, mm. Mm. It's more lively and so, it's I mean, more abundant and it's more wonderful. I mean, this is this is exactly what we're talking about. Like, reflect on your own experience. You know, yeah. like, are you happier when you're yeah. locked up in your own head, yeah. or when you're kind of forgetful of yourself in a way? There's a wonderful phrase of uh, yeah. Saint Teresa of Calcutta. I don't know if she actually said it, but sure. it's attributed She's to the her. repository of yeah. all misattributed quotes. <laughs> and um, and uh, Saint Francis, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Lincoln. <clears throat> and it goes something like this. The person I need most at any given moment is the person who needs me most. Mm. And so what you find here is a kind of interweaving of your good with the good of another. That is, my good is to secure your good. My happiness mm. is found in attempting to secure your happiness. Mm-hmm. And this makes sense for us of the gospel paradox. We must lose our lives to save it. Mm-hmm. 
in some way to be a person means to have the center of gravity of our life beyond us. And if we secure the good of others, we let the same time secure our own authentic good. And it can't be otherwise. If I attempt just to secure my good, I will, won't even be able to be, um, that won't even be possible for you me. You won't have the good of your family. Yeah. You won't have your own good. It's yeah. so true. I mean, I mean, we've all, I, only after you've had kids and learned how difficult it is to raise them, especially through the toddler stages and teenage years, whatever, um, you start to be a heck of a lot more sympathetic to parents who are losing their patience with kids in a grocery store. Yeah. Before you have kids, you're like, oh, how could that mother yeah. treat the but you're like, I get it. You're tired. The kid has asked you 8,000 times. That said, so like wanting to be empathetic to, to to parents who are frustrated with their children, but in a way, the way to, over, and I, I say this in the cold, in, in, the, in the warm light of our reasoning here together, yeah. tomorrow when I'm on an airplane with my family, I might forget it, but like if I'm getting frustrated with my kids, just being like, okay, what is, what is this like for them right now? Like what is... Yeah. What do they want? Why are they frustrated? And if I can put myself in their shoes, yeah. it's yeah. like that sorts it out as opposed to stop it. Just yeah. stop it. Yeah, what yeah. am I saying? I'm saying like stop doing this thing because it's making my life unbearable yeah. as opposed to trying to enter into their experience and ask why it is they're reacting or acting this way. Yeah, but if yeah. I did that, I would actually... Yeah. yeah, and family is a great way to have that center of gravity shifted. <laughs> yes, so I, I was I was single for many years in my adulthood and, and teaching along all the while. And I thought I was serving God and, and I was attempting to do so. Mm. But I recognize now that my service was in a way um, all by my own choice. And it's a whole different ballgame when there's people around you whom you love with real needs and wants and trying to help mm. to... Um, coordinate all of that and try and give yourself over to all of that there's a kind of intensity of it it's it's an an always present being drawn out of yourself and what you said there about what um sitting on the plane and seeing well what do they need now maybe that's a key to it yeah because yeah you often find yourself in the situation of just trying to arrange it so that it's peaceful yeah. Not actually responding to the needs of the other person. And One comedian who will go unnamed once said, we don't want justice as parents. We want quiet. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then at the same time, if we've quiet for too long, we're like, give me some life. It's, it's true. I feel that way with my wife and kids. Sometimes they'll have to go somewhere for a night or two. And my immediate thing is, oh, thank goodness. Yeah. I look forward to having some quiet. Yeah. Four hours go by. I'm like, I don't like this existence at all. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, true. There's a great Parks and Rec line. Sorry. That no, do literally it. Always, just is Parks the, and Rec lines are always welcome on the so show. <laughs> it's it's uh it's in the later show, so it's after Ron's gotten married. Okay. And he says, There I love being a parent, it's great. There are a couple things I miss. Silence, the absence of noise, one single <laughs> second undisturbed by the of the tele, of the sounds of a television children's television program called Doc McStuffins. <laughs> There is no quiet anymore. There is only Doc McStuffins. <laughs> Whoever writes the lines for Ron in that show is a genius. Yeah. 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 He's very quotable. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, what do you, what, how should we wrap up? What, I mean, I usually would say, like, is there a book? Is there a course? Is there so a- in the, for the description, so obviously I can't put it in life. So for the description so far, I have uh, Love and Responsibility. 100%. Uh, and two others. One of them is The Problem of Empathy by uh, St. Teresa Benedicta. And then, oh, Hustler. Uh, hu- hustler. <laughs> who's not who's Hustler? Like- <laughs> yep, can't say it. Uh, logical Investigations. Is yeah, there yeah. anything else I should throw in here? I mean, it's like yeah. as somebody who sort of teaches from the school of phenomenology, is that something you're even interested in, like, telling people about or are you like yeah. not necessarily yeah. it's just something that ought to permeate all the other things that you yeah. should do i think it's one of those words that travels in the catholic air because of what you and mm. uh, his work in theology of the body and so it's good to have some clarification about it and for those who want to go deeper like that logical investigations is a wonderful place to go but it's incredibly dense mm. and so you really want it to have, if you really want your philosophical chops cut you can you can go for the logical investigations there's a really short introduction by a guy called Dan Sahavi, 
Yep, not gonna be able to spell that. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can we can include in it. And then there's a there's a, a lovely introduction by uh, Robert Zakolovsky. Not gonna be able to spell that. I can give both of Why these. Why do none of these people have simple names? I well, know. to be fair, like Smith. I can't spell anything. <laughs> I can't spell end of the sentence. <laughs> And um, then I've got a book coming out later this year. Oh, uh, excellent. Yes. What's, what's it going to be about? It's called Being a Person. Beekeeping. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good book. All right, what's it called? Uh, Being a Person, The Mature Personalism of Edith Stein. Ooh, fantastic. Yeah, so Who are you publishing that with? With CUA. And uh, so hopefully before the end of the year. It's my doctor dissertation reworked for maybe two, three or four years afterwards to try and make it more readable and more book So is it more for a lay, lay audience, would yeah, you say? Yeah, it's for an engaged lay audience. Yeah. And um, scholars would gain some value from it too. But if you really want to delve into what it means to be a person in the Catholic philosophical tradition, taking it in contemporary year with Stein, somewhat Wojtyla, and going back into Aquinas with its distant roots in Aristotle, You'll find some resources there. That's fantastic. Let me know when it's out so we can yeah, promote it. Great. Thanks. That sounds great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. <laughs>